Uh, I'm not a big expert on Palazzi, but I just I wanted to say this about Stewart's work. Okay. And, 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 you know, coming across Stewart's name in, in the Hunter Davies book, the first thing that I and probably most everybody else would think was how on earth, you know, and it's all, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking, how on earth do you quit the Beatles to, like, go stand in an attic and make paintings, you know? And, um, of course, it's easy to look at this, at this now, but two things that are very parallel between Stewart and the Beatles. One is the thing that's always shocking if you do any, any um, research on the band at all, or if you know anything about, you know, their, their, uh, you know, the whole canon, and I'll say canon, you know, it's, uh, it's how much good work there was and how quickly it happened and how much of it happened before they were 24. Mm -hmm. right. When I look at Stewart's work, um, he lived to what, 21, 22? Shocking amount of mature work. And um, I just, um, I teach a drawing class at Suffolk Community College and I just showed them The Lost Beetle the other day, which is a documentary that Pauline is in. And um, they show a lot of his work. And it's just, uh, it's amazing how developed he was, and you can see the passion that he had for his art. It would take something uh, that passionate to get him away. I mean, you know, I'm sure he loved playing with that band, and I, and I know he was crazy about John Lennon. They were best friends. He was probably the first real artist that John Lennon met. And, um, uh, but his, his pull to, uh, uh, to get by himself and to try to figure out what his personal vision was, he was totally driven. And, you know, you see people that are 30 or 35 that don't have the depth of, uh, of investigation that his work had when he was 20 or 21. And uh, so the, the parallel between how much good work happened early, you know, there's a lot of intensity with, with both, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, um, a question I have for both of you, and then maybe we can open things up. What do you think? Sure. Okay. Uh, so my question is, clearly there's... Um, a continued resonance for contemporary culture in terms of what the 60s offered. There's some sort of vision. You're seeing the peaks and valleys. Um, this idea of youth and newness and, and sort of this forward drive. Um, but I have sort of a two-part question here. And one is that, was there ever a moment for you during the period itself where you felt this moment of clarity of like, wow, this is a really unique time, special time, or is that something that comes more from retrospection? Um, and the other part of that is, you know, why do you think, other than maybe the things I already mentioned, why do you think it continues to have this um, allure? Um, why is this nostalgia still around for the 60s, for, you know, as I said before, people who never lived through the period as well? A bunch of reasons, I think. Um, first of all, the people that lived through it are now in positions of power. And uh, they're projecting these media images. I just got a catalog in the mail yesterday. That it's, it had, it's the picture of the Beatles walking through Liverpool, and they're like, you know, 21, restoration hardware. And I'm thinking, like, what says, you know, popular music, like, restoration <laughs> hardware? But, you know, the, the, the Beatles are, are, are well, the, the two that are left, plus Yoko, they're also projecting this sort of thing. There's Beatle Guitar Hero. There's like, you know, they keep rock uh, the rock band. They're, they're, they've remastered these things. You know, they're going to do the, in another whole remastering within three years at a higher sampling rate. So, I mean, uh, they're even jumping on the Beatles. The Beatles are jumping on the Beatles <laughs> anyway, is what it looks like to me. And um, I, I also think the 60s, uh, for as crazy as it was, and, you know, I saw the 60s as a, as a young teenager, so I'm not a huge expert on it. But it, it, um, in terms of, if you look at American car design, for instance, uh, the 50s and 60s, I mean, we were really on top of the game then. And mm -hmm. it looks better and better when you hold it up next to everything that came afterwards. I mean, Eisenhower looks like a god now. I mean, really, when you compare him to like, well, you know, I like Obama, but like a lot of the stuff that's happened since, uh, since uh, JFK, really, for me, not that he was like a god or anything, but I mean, Jesus. <laughs> you compare it, you know, to what's Mon. been going on? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, Eisenhower is like my grandfather by comparison to, I mean, the used car, that's like a line of used car salesmen we've had for 40 years, you know, it's like nuts. Our game show host. Yeah, somebody, you know. Well, I'm still British, so I can't make <laughs> comments. <laughs> But I used to think your cars were better. But now they're all European. I mean, out here, everything's Mercedes. And, well, I even have a British car. I have a Land Rover. So, 
but they're probably made in Germany. Um, well, if, if you look at a 63 Thunderbird, for instance, and you look at a 1980 Thunderbird, the 1980 Thunderbird looks like a shoebox. You know, and, and the, the 63 Thunderbird is like, why do they even bother redesigning it? They just keep it like the Volkswagen, just keep turning these, you know. I digress. Ref references about the 60s? Yeah, just sort of why, why do you think it has a continued presence or resonance in contemporary culture? You know, Christine, if I really knew the answer to that, I'd, it would be the subject of my next book. Um, I have to say, the 60s passed me by mostly. Um, because I was at university, um, I, I was a part of a bereaved a family in bereavement. Um, it, it was a, a totally strange and unique experience to have uh, for parents to lose a child, um, a growing child. I mean, not a baby in infancy. That was slightly more common. So um, it was sort of heads down and, you know, stay out of danger and stay out of trouble and make sure your parents, at least uh, their, their two remaining children, uh, remain with them whole and healthy and mm -hmm. not caught up in any of the madness that was exploding mm -hmm. around everybody at that time. So I, I can't account for, because I didn't experience much of it. I, I knew what was going on. Uh, and I was also um, in denial about mm -hmm. my brother and his membership to the Beatles because um, they were so famous and just about everybody else you knew mm -hmm. knew someone who knew someone who was connected in some way to the Beatles. And so I didn't like the way those references, mm -hmm. you know, were about ten generations long. So, you know, I packed all of that in and, and didn't take any notice of it. Uh, the longevity, I think, has got something to do with how pervasive it was. I mean, it touched every single aspect of life in the end, um, not least of all, um, and, and the Beatles did not spearhead this, but, but part of the movement that they were part of uh, was part of the liberation of women, for example. And hopefully there's no turning back on that, unless, of course, you go and vote for um, Ms. Palin. Um, <laughs> so it was a huge, big phenomenon, and they're just a part of it, I think. Mm -hmm. And that's why it will last. So, um, you know, clearly I'm a media historian, cultural historian. Oh, yes. I'm not an art critic, or I'm not part of the art world per se, but I'm sure many of you have uh, questions in that genre that you would like to ask. Kevin, and if you have uh, questions for Pauline as well, um, who would like to ask a question? Pauline, did you ever uh, go to a Beatles practice or a, con or a uh, show, concert, when your brother was playing with them? Many, many, many. Uh, I think my most famous comment was to my parents because I was sort of sent along to uh, check out, you know. And I could, because both my parents were trained pianists and musicians, con contrary to common belief that we're all from the back streets and feral kids, which isn't <laughs> correct. Um, and I, I, my report back was, do you know, mummy, they can play a whole tune. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have questions so much as thoughts. Um, I was really glad that you talked about the 60s and the darker aspects, you know, because whenever you see anything about Woodstock and everybody's jumping around, stoned out of their heads, and I think that wasn't how it was for me. <laughs> um, I was very much in the 60s, and I think some of the social experiments that went on, you know, make love, not war. Um, you know, it was the beginning, but I think for women especially, it was probably great for the men, but for the women, I think there was a lot of women left bewildered and disappointed and pregnant and, pregnant and confused <laughs> and really quite, quite miserable. I think we thought because we could act like men that we could think and feel like men.